Nobody wants to be called an old duffer nowadays, because it's pretty insulting to be told you're bad, old, and slow. Even the word itself is old, having been around in Victorian times. In those days, it also had negative connotations, for different reasons, but still bad, for a duffer in the 1800s was a rogue, a scourge of the streets, and someone you definitely didn't want to be dealing with. If you weren't streetwise enough to avoid their fast talk, then you were likely to end up having given them a lot of money in return for not a lot. That's right, they were street talkers, but not your commoner garden Victorian peddler of portable goods, but little more than con men who would spin you a yarn to make you believe that they had something valuable to sell. They just happened upon it and had to shift it quick for cash, more than likely for a jolly drink in a bar if they were disguised as a sailor. And yes, you're the lucky person that could be the beneficiary of this chance encounter. In return, you'd believe you're getting something valuable for less than its true worth. But there wasn't an ounce of truth about it. They were passing on stolen or second-rate goods. Scammers of the 1800s, if you like. Many people knew the tricks of these rogues all too well and complained bitterly about them. They always kept one step ahead of the police, however, avoiding being caught in the act of selling smuggled goods. But enough people still fell victim to their tall tales so as to keep them and their cons in business. It's no wonder the word duffer is still used as an insult to this day. Today, you will learn how these Victorian villains duped people with smuggled goods on the streets of London in the 1840s. This is told in a genuine account recorded by Henry Mayhew, a Victorian journalist. Mayhew's work is important as he went to much trouble to describe the lives of everyday people in London and went into great detail about their clothes, customs, work and pastimes, including thieves, vagabonds and, of course, duffers. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. Of duffers and lumpers, as regards the sale of textile fabrics, there are generally, I am informed, about 20 in London. At such times as Epsom, Ascot Heath, or Goodwood Races, however, there is perhaps not one. All have departed to prey, if possible upon the countrymen. They are generally dressed as sailors, and some wear either fur caps or cloth ones with gilt bands round them, as if they were the mates or stewards of ships. They look out for any likely victim at public houses, and sometimes accost persons in the street, first looking carefully about them, and hint that they are smugglers and have the finest and cheapest ingy handkerchiefs ever seen. These goods are now sold in pieces of three handkerchiefs. When times were better, I was told they were in pieces of four, five, and six. One street seller said to me, Yes, I know, the duffers, all of them. They do more business than you might think. Everybody likes a smuggled thing, and I should say these men, each of the duffers, tops his one pound a week, clear profit. I am assured that one of the classes most numerously victimized is a body who generally account themselves pretty sharp, that is to say, gentlemen's grooms and coachmen at the several mews. Sailors are the best customers, and the vicinity of the docks the best locality for this trade, for the hawker of pretended smuggled goods always does most business among the tars. The mock handkerchiefs are damped carefully with a fine sponge before they are offered for sale, and they are often strongly perfumed, some of the Jews supplying cheap perfumes or common scents. When the duffer thinks he may venture upon the assertion, he assures a customer that this is the smell of handkerchiefs brought with him from foreign parts, as they were smuggled in a bale of spices. The trade, however, is not without its hazards, for I am informed that the duffers sometimes, on attempting their impositions imprudently, and sometimes on being discovered before they can leave the house, get soundly thrashed. They have, of course, no remedy. The pieces of three handkerchiefs sold by the duffers are purchased by them in Houndsditch, at from three to seven shillings, but seven shillings is only given when there is a design to palm off the three shillings goods along with them. 
One intelligent street trader, to whom I am indebted for carefully considered information, said to me very quietly, I've read your work, sir, at a coffee shop, for I can't afford to take it in. I know you're going to open the eyes of the public as to the duffer's tricks. Now, all right, sir, they're in honest men's ways, but, sir, when are you going to say something about the rich shopkeepers as sells and the rich manufacturers as makes the duffer's things? Every man of them knows it's for roguery. There is a peculiar style among the duffers. They never fold their goods neatly, the same as drapers do, but thrust them into the pack in a confused heap, as if they did not understand their value or their business. There are other classes of duffers whose calling is rather more hazardous than the licensed hawker duffer. I've often thought it strange, says a correspondent, that these men could induce anyone to credit the fact of their being sailors, for notwithstanding the showy manner in which they chew their quid, a hunk of something to chew, and the jack-tar-like fashion in which they suffer their whiskers to grow, there is such a fresh waterfied appearance about them that they look no more like a regular mariner than the supernumerary seamen in a nautical drama at the Victoria Theatre. Yet they obtain victims readily. Their mode of proceeding in the streets is to accost their intended dupes. While walking by their side, they usually speak in an half whisper, as they keep pace with them, and look mysteriously around to see if there are any of them here custom-house sharks afloat. They address the simple-looking passers-by thus. Shipmate! Here they take off their fur cap and spit their quid into it. Shipmate, I've just come ashore after a long voyage, and splice me, but I've something in the locker that'll be of service to you. And shiver me timbers. They are very profuse in nautical terms. You shall have it at your own price, for I'm determined to have a spree, and I haven't a shot in the locker. Elms a lee. Just let's turn into this creek, and I'll show you what it is. Perhaps he persuades his dupe down a court or to a neighbouring public house. Now, here is a beautiful piece of ingy handkerchiefs. They are the coarsest description of spun, not thrown silk. Well stiffened into stoutness, and cost the duffer perhaps fifteen pence each. But as business is always done on the sly, in a hurry, and to escape observation, an examination seldom or never takes place. I got him on shore in spite of those pirates, the custom house officers. You shall have them cheap. There's half a dozen on them. They cost me uh, thirty shillings at Madras. You shall have them for the same money. The victim, maybe, is not inclined to purchase. The pretended tar, however, must have money. Will you give me twenty-five shillings for them? He says, Damn it, a pound. Shiver me top sails. You don't want them any cheaper than that, do you? The duffer says this to make his dupe believe that he really does want the goods, or has offered a price for them. Perhaps if the duffer cannot extort more, he takes ten shillings for the half-dozen ingy handkerchiefs, the profit being thus about two shillings sixpence. But more frequently he gets one hundred and even two hundred per cent on his transactions, according to the gullibility of his customers. The duffer deals also in cigars. He accosts his victim in the same style as when selling handkerchiefs, and gives himself the same sailor-like airs. Sometimes the duffers visit the obscure streets in London, where there are small chandler's shops. One of them enters, leaving his mate outside to give him the signal in case the enemy heaves in sight. He requests to be served with some trifling article. When he approves of the physiognomy of the shopkeeper and considers him or her likely to be victimized, he ventures an observation as to how enormously everything is taxed though to one less innocent it might appear unusual for a sailor to talk politics. Even this here backy, he says, taking out his quid. Oh, I can't chew without paying a tax. But, he adds, chuckling, us sailor chaps sometimes shirks the custom house lubbers, sharp as they are. Here his companion outside puts his head in at the door, and to make the scene as natural as possible says, Come on, Jack, don't stop there all night spinning your yarns. Come, bear a hand or I shall part convoy. Oh, heave a bit longer, me arty, replies the duffer. I'll be with you in the twinkling of a marlin spike. I'll tell you what we've got, ma'am, and if you likes to buy it, you shall have it cheap, for me and me mate are both short of rhino. Cash. We've half a dozen pounds of tea. You can weigh it if you like, and you shall have the lot for twelve shillings. Perhaps there is an immediate purchase, but if twelve shillings is refused, then ten, eight, or six shillings is asked, until a sale be effected, after which the sailors make their exit as quickly as possible. Then the chandler's shopkeeper 
begins to exult over the bargain he or she has made, and to examine more minutely the contents of the neatly packed and tea-like looking packet thus bought, it proves to be lined with the profuse quantity of tea lead, hard sheet lead, originally used as lining for tea chests. And though some Chinese characters are marked on the outside, it is discovered on opening to contain only a half a pound of tea, the remainder consisting principally of chopped hay. The duffers enact the same part, and if a purchaser buys ten pounds of the smuggled article, then nine pounds at least consists of the same chopped hay. Sometimes the duffers sell all their stock to one individual. No sooner do they dispose of the handkerchiefs to a dupe than they introduce the smuggled tobacco to the notice of the unsuspecting customer. Then they palm off their cigars, next their tea, and lastly, as the duffer is determined to raise as much money as he can to have his spree, "'Why, damn!' he explains to his victim. "'I'll sell you me watch. It cost me six pound at Portsmouth. <gasps> "'Give me three pounds for it and it's yours, shipmate.' Well then, two pounds, one pound. The watch, I need not state, is made solely for sale. It is really astonishing, adds my informant, how these men ever succeed, for their look denotes cunning and imposition, and their proceedings have been so often exposed in the newspapers that numbers are alive to their tricks, and warn others when they perceive the duffers endeavouring to victimise them. But, as the thimble men say, swindlers, there's a fool born every minute.